So is every, everybody uh, ready to get settled here? We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm actually really pleased to be able to introduce Sam Watson today. Sam's a good friend of mine back from when I was at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, he spent the last two years in Iraq um, and actually has a really remarkable history and a lot of really remarkable experience prior to that. Uh, but I thought it would be really interesting to hear about his experience over the last couple of years in Iraq serving as a regional uh, public health official helping to establish uh, the, the public health infrastructure within, um, within uh, a province within southern Iraq, and he'll talk a lot about that. Um, I knew Sam when he was at the University of Pittsburgh, and he was in our Center for Public Health Preparedness, um, and he brings uh, a really deep experience in bioterrorism. He had actually served uh, in the first Bush administration in the vice president's office, I believe, um, as a senior advisor around uh, preparedness and bioterrorism issues. Um, he also has a very distinguished military career, um, and um, I'm going to let him tell you a lot about a lot of this, but I'll just read a few of the highlights here. Um, uh, he was Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh from 1999 to 2005. Uh, he was the Deputy National Security Advisor to the Vice President, Deputy to the Chief U.S. Arms Negotiator, Chief of Staff of the Presidential Transition Team at the CIA, an exchange officer at the State Department European Bureau. He was a colonel in the military um, and um, served as, as uh, um, where am I here? Served as um, 10 years of active duty Army career uh, on detail to the civ civilian national security agencies of the federal government. Um, as I mentioned, he spent the last two years in Iraq. Uh, uh, helping to uh, with the state provincial reconstruction team, helping, help, helping to uh, establish the infrastructure uh, for public health in the southern part of the country. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Sam, and he will okay. tell you all about it. The problem with asking <clears throat> the problem with asking Mike Mate to introduce me is that he glorifies or he says too much. He almost read an obituary, I think. And, and, uh, but you've heard that joke before, so I won't, won't go there. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, what Mike uh, asked me to do, is to talk to you about uh, two years in Iraq, what we did in the public health area there. But I, let me just preface it by saying, I was there for two years. I was a State Department employee. Uh, they, had, they have a mechanism for hiring people with specialties that they don't have, but they make you one of their regular employees. Um, I was there for two years. The first year, I was the public health advisor in a province. Uh, for those of you that know the Canadian system or whatever, a province is just like a state here, uh, very large, very diverse. Uh, I, I continued doing the public health the second year. They asked me to stay. I did the public, continued doing that. But officially, I then became the governance advisor because in the wisdom of the United States government, the United States Embassy in Baghdad, they decided they didn't need public health advisors. Now, you talk about dumb. If anybody is here from the United States government would like to quote me, it's dumb. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I was the governance advisor, which meant I had to advise the governor and his staff and the pro provincial council and their staff and all the departments and agencies uh, across from, from water to sewer to you name it on, on how to be. I'm leery when I use the word democracy in talking about what we were trying to do because that wasn't one of, at least to me, wasn't one of our goals was to jam democracy down their throats. Uh, I, I like to think of what I was doing is at least trying to, by discussing, by mentoring, by advising them, uh, set, show them and give them an example, give them some ideas, show them uh, ways that we might, have, might do things in the United States or in the West, and if they liked them, they could adapt them and we could uh, then uh, discuss it further and try to help them and train and that sort of thing. The third job that I had in my second year was as the public diplomacy officer, and in State Department speak, public diplomacy means telling the American story one telling the American story of what American policy is and what we're doing. But secondly, it was to train media in whatever country you're in, 
training, in my case, training Iraqi media in investigative journalism and how to find out what the government is doing. And the third role of a public diplomacy officer is to train the government in how to deal with the media. So one, so one day I, I was talking to the governor and he said, Watson, I know what you're, it didn't say say it Watson or Mr. Watson or any honorific. Uh, he said, Watson, and I knew what was coming. <laughs> I knew something was coming. He said, I know what you're doing when you talk to me about you want to train me in media affairs. You want me to deal with the media and you want me to talk to the press. And I said, Governor Solemn, that's exactly right. That's the way you can get support. If you deal with the media, if you talk to the media, people will not be rioting out front of the governor's, uh, out of outside of the government compound. They won't be walking a donkey down the street with your name written on the side of the donkey. You won't have to call out the riot police. <clears throat> you can devote your time and attention to other things. Well, he said, yeah, maybe. He said, and so in the other job was training the media in how to make it tough for the governor by asking him hard questions. So he sort of had me in the middle working the two sides against, the, against each other. But, you know, that's what one of the things that wasn't a, what we were supposed to be doing, but it's really was the outcome and the environment that we're in. Of, there was a lot of resistance to, uh, to Western ways, and that's quite all right. You know, every country has to, had to develop in its own way. Uh, but let me stop talking about that kind of thing. What Mike asked me to do was talk about uh, what we were doing in public health. And then, as I just said over lunch, he made it a little more difficult by asking me to talk about a little bit of security, energy, and environment, and a little bit, a little bit about international affairs. And, and now I understand a little bit about uh, drug abuse and criminal justice issues, which, which in that area I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, so I wouldn't attempt to, to bluff you on that one. Uh, he also said, gee, it would be good if you had some pictures of... of <laughs> I, I, do not, I do not play the saxophone and I do not dance. <laughs> uh, and he asked me to layer in a, a couple of pictures that would illustrate the points to show you what Iraq was like. So let me, let me just do that. I don't know if any of you had printed out the uh, 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 talk, the PowerPoints that I made, but if I may, let me just go through a couple of them and tell you a little bit here. Uh, and I don't want to speak for a long time. I'd rather leave time uh, for, some dis for some discussion. If you keep it at a low level, we can pretend it's lounge music. <laughs> okay, well, let me go ahead anyway, and I'll see what, I, see what we can do here. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask several questions, and, and in a way they're related, and in ways they're not related. And maybe we can talk about them as we go through, and then tr I'll try to work with you to pull these uh, questions together as we get towards the end. We may or may not be able to pull them together. I mean, even asking whether government legitimacy can be measured, the question you have to really begin with is step back one and say, to many countries, does it matter whether they feel themselves to be legitimate or not, their government to be legitimate? Uh, but if you assume that you want to measure legitimacy, then let's say, what are the measures? Uh, what we always talk to the Iraqis about, uh, of any variety, and, and let, me, let me step away from, for a minute and tell you, when I say we, I'm talking about a provincial reconstruction team. There was one in every province in Iraq 
there were 18 or 19 teams around the country in the outside provinces, and then six teams in Baghdad. Baghdad was like six or eight million people divided up into, you know, you've heard of Sadr City and Qatamiya and, uh, and other parts of Baghdad. There was a PRT in each of those also. And if typical PRT had a team leader, a senior foreign service officer from the State Department Foreign Service, usually an Army lieutenant colonel as the deputy team leader who provided some military support. We had some of that. Uh, we would have a public diplomacy officer, an agriculture advisor or team. In our case, a team because we're an agricultural province. We had a business development officer or economic development person. We had a U.S. Agency for International Development officer uh, to administer their programs. We had a civil engineer to work with the water, the sanitation, the uh, roads, highways, and electricity sectors. Only half the PRTs had a public health officer or a public health advisor. And so in, in reality, I actually spanned two provinces. So that's when I say we, that's what I really mean. So what we always tried to emphasize to the different people we talk to or, or this first sub-tick is, are you making whatever you're doing responsive, accountable, sustainable? Uh, what else do I have? Do the people trust you? Uh, and when I say it, even in something like accountable, let's go back to what I was saying about the governor earlier. If he gives an interview to the media and they ask him hard questions, he's being accountable to the people. Uh, the theory is he had to get reelected, and they have elections. And are you working together or the different parts of the government? This was a hurdle. You know, in the United States, we think about uh, that agencies should talk to each other, that different sections of your, of your office talk to each other. Uh, this was a difficult issue of getting the water people to talk to the health people, to talk to the sanitation people, to talk to, to, and, and, I'll, and I'll touch on that in a, in a minute. Uh, where Mike and I started out a couple of weeks ago about this talk is what are the differences in culture uh, between uh, the Iraqi providing essential services in Iraq and the experience in Iraq and the experience here? And, you know, that sort of pulls us into a, in a lot of different directions. I'll try to sort of keep it in the public health emergency preparedness security areas, something like that, though if I stray, I, I'll beg, beg your forgiveness. Uh, but you often, often found uh, that, that not just culture, not just American Iraqi culture, but within the Iraqi society, uh, you're seeing now a lot of uh, violence going on there, some of it Shia on Shia, some of it Sunni on Shia, some of it Sunni on Shia, verse vice, Kurd on them, them on Kurd. Uh, this made it really hard. We had, I mean, just as a small example, our team had a number of linguists, all spoke Arabic, but one was from Sudan. He had lived in England and the United States for a long time. His father had been ambassador to the United Kingdom. His English was perfect, but every Arab said, he's not an Arab, he's, and he was very dark-skinned, uh, more African than, than Arab. and. Uh, and he had a very Sudanese accent, and they would pick it up and they would say, where's he from? We had another linguist who was absolutely exceptional, also our, our team clown, uh, kept our humor up. Uh, Abdul Salam Mullah uh, was Kurdish. And they would immediately pick up the Kurdish accent. And it became significant because Saddam Hussein had moved a lot of Kurds into our area when he was trying to uh, do some ethnic cleansing both up north and where we were. And we can talk about ethnic cleansing if, if you want, but it's not a happy topic. Uh, but so that even that little bit of diversity on our team, whereas to us, it you know, we want diversity, we believe in it. Uh, for them, it was, who are these real foreigners that you're trying to use? Uh, other issues that, that faced us were what, how did the donor, what did donors want to do, international donor organizations, NGOs, how did they do it? Uh, and we can talk about our work mostly with the United Nations, the ICRC, and those kinds of groups. Uh, you could ask the question, the second major bullet, of whether uh, what we're going to talk about 
whether any of the measures, whether any of the uh, experiences are applicable in a country like Iraq, which was developed, but to an even less developed country or to a more developed country or to a completely developed such as our own. Uh, and finally, something we had to quote, I'm sorry, that we had to cope with uh, was, were the issues of terrorism and the constant threat. There were always people trying to kill us, kidnap us, whatever. You didn't want to, you'd rather get killed than get kidnapped in most cases. Uh, it was a serious issue and for those of you that follow the news, uh, you might note that the American Embassy in Baghdad has put out yet another uh, kid, beware of getting kidnapped. Uh, we out in the country really had to think about it, uh, whether we were going to get kidnapped by whether they were local terrorists or Iranian-supported terrorists. Uh, not just what would happen to us, but where we would go, because in the case of the Iranian-supported terrorists, they were kidnapping people and taking them over into Iran, smuggling back over to there. But these were, these were the kinds of issues that affected everything we did. Uh, we, we had to think about it. Let me jump to the next slide. Uh, I see that most of you don't, so I didn't mean to jump to the next slide quite yet. Uh, but I want you to think about when I got up this morning, when you got up, you brushed your teeth, you took a shower, you got dressed, you jumped in the car, you came down here. No problems, not, not any worries whatsoever. Here's what we had to do when we went to work. That is, when we went outside the walls, outside the, as we said, outside the wire. If I would go out, and here you can see me there in my uh, blue shirt and khaki pants with my 40-pound armored vest on, ballistic glasses, and I'd have 14 or 15 guys with, with uh, automatic weapons with me. In, and you can see in the back, uh, back up here, you can see the armored Humvees with the machine gun turrets and mounted and all that. And uh, this was standard procedure anywhere we went outside the wire, which, you know, it doesn't seem like much, but it, what it did was, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if you've been there for two years and you've been attacked a couple times a week and all that, you know, after a while it doesn't seem like much to, to suit up with these guys and go somewhere. Uh, but. What it did is, is it really sometimes put it, the way you arrive, the way you present yourself, and I know you're doing some work or had done some work in, in Qatar uh, and those areas, is, is so, so important. I would roll up and until, and we, we changed security teams. Each security team would want to search the building, would want to, they never wanted to search the people I was going to talk to, but they would want to search the building, make sure there was nobody lurking in the background. They would want to sit in the meetings with me. Uh, you know, and they're all lovely guys. They're really dedicated, hardworking soldiers. But you know, having a couple of soldiers with weapons, with helmets and guns uh, across their laps, sitting in a meeting, doesn't, you know. And eventually, I convinced them that. That's okay. I can be in a room by myself. If you don't hear, if you hear a lot of noise and commotion, then you can come rescue me. But you know, don't worry about it. And uh, we even got to a point eventually uh, where we would park the vehicles, the Humvees, out on the road, and they would let me take my helmet, my vest, everything, throw it back in the Humvee, and we'll put my suit coat on, take off my fire, Nomex fireproof gloves, take off my ballistic glasses, and they would let me walk in with no protection whatsoever. They would still have all theirs. And, but, it, you know, but there were always two or three or four guys. Some places we would go, we would go through the rehearsals. We're going down to the water plant. We're going to the electrical plant. Okay, as we walk in, Jones, Smith, Green, and Brown, different soldiers, I'm making up names, they're going to be on each corner of you walking you in. And if anything happens, one of them is going to grab you by the scruff of the, your neck and drag you out and just do whatever he says. That's fine. But, you know, the, the object lesson is not to tell you uh, what I've told you. The object lesson is it's tough, it's difficult, and some of these places you don't want to go. I mean, maybe some of you do. Uh, maybe some of you would just love to be there. It's, it's great work, let me tell you. It, it, I've had 
several great jobs in my life, and this was one of them. Uh, this was one of the, the best jobs I've ever had. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes uh, the cultural side, the security side, the language side, all those things can really affect how you, how you come across and how you present yourself. And we had to cope with this every day. So let me get now, try to get into some meat here. Next slide, please. Chicago, next slide. Okay. Uh, I've talked a little bit about different cultures, uh, but Mike asked me if I would talk a little bit about Iraq, United States. Uh, where I was in Iraq, they expected the government to do less. They didn't have much trust, confidence in the government. Uh, they didn't think the government was very accountable. Uh, so they expected much less from it, from the government, and at the same time they demanded much more from the government. They knew their expectations were low, their demands were high. That gap, which I think is measurable from, from the way you approach social science things, that gap uh, was enormous, created demonstrations, created riots. Four to six hours of electricity a day is, is not conducive to happy people. Uh, just little things like that. Um, let me talk about public health for just a second. Uh, in Iraq, yes, we had the, the whole range of, of doctors, doctor skills. We had the whole range of uh, things you would expect. But the doctors usually had only a four-year education, and, it, and it's a bachelor's level education. It's not a real MD the way we look at it. Uh, the nurses weren't allowed to do anything. They were, they were essentially bedpan people, even though the School of Nursing at, at the university on the other side of the Euphrates, Kufa University, had an exceptional school of nursing that I visited several times. Ambulances, you know, we expect an ambulance to come ready to go. They had wonderful ambulances, brand new Mercedes ambulances all kitted out with great stuff, with a driver dressed just as I am, driving it, and that was all there was in the ambulance. There was nobody in the back, no EMT. They didn't have an idea of, of EMT and emergency medical services, which um, meant in one case uh, coming up from uh, the primary health clinic in Shinafia, which is 45 miles from the, from the, the governate capital, uh, they told me eight or 10 people died a month just during transit uh, for lack of uh, an attendant in the back, people dying from heart attack or stroke, things like that. Uh, we tried to start, I'll jump ahead, but we tried to start uh, an EMS training program. Baghdad had a really good one going at the U.S. military who had a lot of reservists. They, the U.S. Army has reservists out the gazoo that are firemen, EMS from around here, from around wherever, and they were there trying to set up the school and train it. They had firemen in their fire brigades and they had police, but none of them really integrated, none of them integrated with each other in emergency management, disaster. If there was an explosion, if there was a building fire, something like that, they were all almost fighting with each other uh, as, to, as to who should do what. And there was no EMS 911 system as we understand it uh, for where you would call the 911 and they would dispatch a fire truck and an ambulance and somebody to supervise and the hospital would get the advance word that we're bringing patients in. It, it just don't work like, like that where I was. Uh, whereas here, you know, we have the, the complete range of integrated services and we'll talk about resilience in a minute. Uh, but when I talk about coordination and cooperation, uh, I'll give you a prime example, and uh, I guess it's a couple slides down. I'll give you a prime example. We had an outbreak of H1N1. Well, it was worldwide outbreak of H1N1, uh, 2009, 2010, and that. Uh, the province I was in, Diwania province, we had the highest per capita infection rate in all of Iraq. We had the highest death rate in all of Iraq per capita. The province across the river from us, uh, Najaf province, which you read about a lot in the news, it's the, the center of Shiism. It's second only to Mecca uh, uh, in, in where uh, Muslims go to, uh, to worship. 
The shrine in Najaf attracts millions of people a year. We, we had, let's give you some background, we had caravans of buses every day going through during pilgrimage time of Iranians coming through our, our province, through our town on their way to Najaf. Uh, Najaf had a, uh, the second highest infection and death rate per capita. Why? Well, you had people coming from all over the world. You had them living in very close quarters with each other. Believe me, they don't have Marriott hotels and Hilton hotels. They're, they're pretty, pretty poor by anybody's standards. Uh, and you have uh, so much disease transmission. This, so what did we do about it? Well, we, the Americans, we couldn't come in and take over the Iraqi health system. There, there was no way of doing that. Uh, USAID is now trying to do, is now coming back to Iraq and trying to do a little. I hope they succeed. Uh, yeah, they got, they got the antivirals, the vaccination immunizations uh, in, but then Kamadia, the Iraqi government uh, pharmaceutical company, wouldn't certify them because they had made it, been made in the United States, UK, and Germany. And since they didn't observe the manufacturing process and they didn't have quality control over it, they wouldn't certify them. Eventually, the Prime Minister demanded that they release them, and once they started releasing, their rates went down. But before that, what did we do? Well, we tried to talk to them about the interagency process, about uh, cross-agency cooperation. And so we suggested to the governor that he get everybody around the table, and we did, and I worked with him, and he developed a script of how he would run this interagency meeting, something he usually didn't do. And uh, he went around the table and invited water, sewer, police, university, hospital, clinic, uh, and then the different public health people, the schools, the different school directors that were there, invited each to talk about the problem and what they had that might contribute to it. And then he tasked them to, you talk to you, you talk to you, and directed them to, to essentially talk to each other, uh, something that they had not intended to do. A different thing we did is we immediately uh, started making leaflets. Uh, I made 50,000, I had 50,000, an Iraqi printer made 50,000 leaflets for me. On one side, was uh, uh, potable water, drinking water, how to make sure your water is drinkable and usable. And on the other side, I had a lot about H1N1, of uh, what it is about that much, and then a lot about wash your hands, wash your face, use soap, use hot water when you can, cover your face if, you, if you're coughing, put on a mask or put a cloth, you know, just simple things like that. And, and we did see the rate, uh, the infection rate and the death rate go down from from, I don't have, have the, uh, I mean, if, if you want, we can later on, I can, uh, I'm, I'll have to stick a thumb drive in to pull it up, but uh, we can talk about that. But there, uh, it's those little things, Iraq prided itself as a developed, well, we're still developing country, but trying to make simple things happen like that. And it goes back to this expect less, expect more, the gap that exists, that uh, they didn't expect much from the government, so they didn't demand much, and yet they demanded an, an awful lot on the population basis, but the director generals and it didn't bang their, their fist. Yes, sir? What was the level of corruption? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good point because I hinted at it on the commodity and the antiviral for H1N1. Uh, Part of the issue on the antiviral was not just the quality control and the certification by United States and whomever the manufacturer was. Part of it was, how do I get my 20%? Uh, the level of corruption in many of those kind of countries is high in Iraq, a high level of financial and political corruption. Uh, we always figured that somehow 20 to 50% of any project money that we put out there was going into somebody's unrelated to the project pocket. I mean, well, I mean, it's you don't know. I mean, you see all these figures that you know different government agencies say twenty to fifty percent, but I don't know how they compute that. What do you do? You do a survey of the 
of everybody and you say, how much corruption, how much are you raking off on, on these contracts? We had a very good relation with the deputy governor for uh, engineering. Very, very smart man, wonderful college education. And we would brief him every couple of weeks, myself and the, and the civil engineer would go down and sit down with him and go through each project. And he would always ask, who's, who's the contractor? Who's doing it? And how much money are you paying him? And this sort of gets back to your question is how much corruption? And we would say, yes, we've awarded a contractor. We're planning to. We're in the bidding stage now. And it's and we don't know what the price will be because it hasn't been awarded. And we would is try to evade those kind of questions because obviously he would call up one of his minions and say, go out to meet and company and, and get my 50%. Uh, that's not a very good answer, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, one, there's, I don't think there's a way of knowing how much corruption there is. Uh, and two, trying to pin it down and trying to find out who's doing it. You can't. And then three, trying to get any of the judicial system. We had, oh, I failed to mention we had a rule of law advisor. Trying to, the rule of law advisor trying to talk to the prosecutors, trying to talk to the investigative judges, the I, uh, IJs, investigative judges, to get them to investigate <clears throat> uh, third deputy Governor Jones uh, for corruption. Just didn't work. The one way we, try, we tried to solve it on our projects was keep the dollar values down so there's less room for corruption, but secondly, very detailed uh, project plans of three desks at $200 each. And, but then we had uh, people that worked for us that did independent market surveys, and we would just give them a list each month of, you know, go out and find out how much a desk, a chair, a this, a that, 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 and, and how much... Uh, you know, food cost, a lot of that kind of thing. And that way we could then have an idea when somebody was bidding on something and they would say a new desk uh, of that type and we'd give them the picture and the specifications and the manufacturer and all that and they would say, well, that's $400. We'd say, well, we know somebody that can get it for us for 200 So that's the, you know, it, I mean, and it, and it drives your brain crazy and it takes up a lot of your time when you should be out there trying to help people, which is what we want to do, and you're spending all your time as an auditor trying to do that. It's, did that help a little bit? Okay. Now maybe some of you have different experiences on corruption than, than I did. Uh, okay, we, I was talking about interagency in H1N1 for a minute there. So we got the, the, the rates down considerably. Uh, this is just a representative uh, Representation, representative uh, accomplishments that, that we had. Uh, and uh, let's see, Chicago, if you would go to the slide, public health programs with U.S. support in Diwania province, uh, it will be, there you go. Uh, this is, as I said, just representative of some of the accomplishments. Since I couldn't get in there and say, change this, do this, do this, do this. I figured maybe I could affect the system and bring some good to them by some education, some training, some mentoring and advising. We decided early on, we the team, because every project had to go through a board, uh, but I got about $175,000 uh, to build and equip this training center and on every project, the Iraqis had to contribute at least 50%. Uh, I always tried to get them to contribute 51 or more percent, uh, but the embassy required 50%. Uh, there was sometimes creative accounting here uh, on our part, but you know, when you believed in the project, you, you did what you did to make it happen. I'll show you a picture in a minute of uh, the Public Health Training Center, both a little bit of before and after. But I, but I had two major programs that I, that I wanted to institute there. One was midwife training. Now part of this goes back to the statistic that the World Health Organization and the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office says that 99% of the women that are pregnant in Iraq have access to prenatal care. I don't believe that for a minute because I was out in the countryside an awful lot. 
I made it my task once a week to go out and find a primary health clinic. I mean, I had a very good list of all 56 of them uh, to go out and visit one of them and to walk in during in the middle of the morning because that was how long it would take to get there with our security and everything, but get there when it was peak patient hour. Well, how many patients? How busy is the place? Interrupt the doctor, sit down with him and have a chat, and he would tell me he was seeing 300 patients a day. Well, that would be okay if you worked 18 hours a day. That might be okay. In this case, they worked four hours a day from nine to one. And, and the by and by there is four hours, because they were, everything is a government salary, everything's a government facility. Well, I don't have enough time to see you, so why don't you come see me in my private clinic this afternoon? Of course, you have to, it's fee for service this afternoon. This morning, it's not, it's free. So I, I, I asked doctors, how do you see 200, 300 people in four hours? Let's divide that out. That's 45 seconds per patient. And by the way, what records do you have when when Mike comes in, did, does he bring a record? Does a nurse bring the record? Do you have electronic medical records? Well, there are no electronic medical records. They're starting to develop that now. Uh, yes, they had paper records, but the doctor rarely, rarely looked at them. So, okay, uh, Abdul, meet. Uh, what's the matter with you? Well, my stomach hurts. And what do you need? I need aspirin. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. It, it was very patient-owned diagno diagnosis and patient-owned prescribed medications. It, 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 it's just sad to watch. It, it, you know, it breaks your heart. Uh, so we built this training center because so many women were dying in childbirth. Uh, so many children were dying in childbirth or significant uh, uh, disability issues. They frequently had to break break shoulders to get a child out of the birth canal, uh, 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 child out of the birth canal. And uh, so I instituted the midwife training program. It took a lot of work and a lot of money, it was totally separate, another hundred or so thousand dollars of your tax dollars. But I think we graduated two classes, 30 each, and I think we made a significant. Why did I want to do that? Because I was, you know, as I would go out, I wouldn't see women in the clinics getting prenatal care. I wouldn't see any literature about prenatal care, about nutrition, about vitamins, about disease, about sexually transmitted diseases, about other diseases associated with birthing. Uh, I wouldn't see any posters on the walls with pictures. And I'd talk to the doctors and of course they wanted a program in their place because that would mean money and coming to them and they would tell me about it. But after a while, you, you know, the scientific methods of gathering data in a place like that were, were not, didn't work. And that's why I question the World Health Organization saying 99% got prenatal care. Uh, a, lot of, a lot did birth uh, at, at a central hospital. There were five, five main hospitals in our province scattered around. But uh, a lot of women just didn't go to them because the midwife system in many developing countries that those of you that have been, how many of you have been in a developing, underdeveloped country? Anybody? Where, where have you been? Colombia? Guatemala? Somebody else was in one? El Salvador. I've been there, been there, done that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, you've seen developed countries compared to what we had. All those countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Colombia, from what I understand, are pretty well developed compared to what we had. Uh, I'll show you. I think I have a picture on, on here of, of some of the primary health clinic and the conditions. And, uh, well, so we did that. We, we did the, some emergency management and tried to get that going at the, at the public health training center uh, to try to bring the coordination together. Uh, I talked about the H1N1 and I talked about the advising and mentoring. Uh, Chicago, let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, 
I talked about a little bit of the H1N1 response, but we broke it down into the different areas where that we thought where we could have an, a, an effect. And there's a very good article that I quote at you can, Chicago, you may be able to see it, but, but this is a very good article on how to approach some of these problems. Uh, and you might want to look at that. Uh, but you know, if you really think about in public health, how do you know you have a problem? And this is something that I worked on at the University of Pittsburgh quite a bit in the bioterrorism area of just gathering the data getting the data in and making sense of the data on how you try to pick up your, your uh, sentinel case and try to pick, pick up additional cases. Uh, of course, a lot of confirmation requires a lot of laboratory work. Uh, we tried to break it down into what we could do medically. In the legal sense, it was closing schools. Couldn't close the mosques, but at least we got the Iraqis to close schools. Uh, if they, and we worked with them, there was no national standard uh, we worked them, with them to develop a standard in our province that if they had more than, depending on a, a per capita size of the school, more than you know, two kids per hundred that showed symptoms, they would close the school for a couple of days. Was it effective? I don't know that it was effective or mattered because the kids would just mingle out on the street and play with each other. But at least they weren't, that was open air with a little bit of wind uh, coming through. Uh, we tried, uh, as I've mentioned, to uh, work on some of how they handled cases in the hospitals and, and trying to get them to segregate people, trying to uh, get them to segregate people, uh, what we would call isolation wards or isolation systems. They didn't have uh, positive and negative pressure isolation uh, the way we expect them to. Risk communication I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and. The other thing is they couldn't stop the religious pilgrims from coming over to Najaf and, and another city, holy city, Karbala, just to the north, uh, because that would destroy the economy in those provinces. And yet it was just kept spreading the disease further and further. Uh, you know, here this is just a typical coordination meeting that that we had uh, at at the Department of Health in the Director General's conference room. But you can see. Uh, this is a, a number of hospital uh, directors, uh, the epidemiologist, uh, the statisticians, uh, trying to solve it at the public health level. Just by and by, uh, the woman you see here, here, uh, she was an army major, a very skilled surgeon. And we were lucky. We got her for about a month onto our base uh, when, when the, the permanent doctor went on leave, and she came down to, to staff uh, our little clinic, which was, wasn't much bigger than this room, the, the soldier clinic. But she, w she saved, at least for a while, saved the life of a young Iraqi girl who had head-to-toe uh, burns, an explosion of uh, a gas can in her home, head-to-toe burns. They took the young woman, her brothers took her to the main, the main big hospital in town, and they said, well, we can't do anything for her, so just take her home and let her die. This doctor put her on the stretcher, and we didn't have things like operating tables, on a canvas stretcher, and started debriding all the wounds, taking, taking it apart, and trying to bandage it and, and do what she could. We got permission and used an Army medical, medevac helicopter. Uh, she, the patient, and all, they went to an Army hospital up in Baghdad. We nobody's supposed to know we violated Army rules and we let our brothers go with her on the helicopter. The pilot let them go. He made that decision with a little bit of my pleading. The, the poor girl died. The one time she woke up at our clinic, at, at the clinic, the military clinic on our base, the one time she woke up, she looked at, at the female surgeon and said, what will I look like? She was a pretty young girl, and she died just because of the way, the lack of electricity. The governor d couldn't figure out how to provide electricity. Therefore, they had to have gasoline to run a generator for their air conditioning, their television, and their uh, refrigerator. Because of that, she died. Uh, Chicago, next slide, please. Uh, risk communications I talked about. Uh, or any communications, public diplomacy. This, this is meant to be a silly picture, 
so you're supposed to laugh. Uh, thank you. Uh, but, I, but I'm giving an interview to a large number of media here, and uh, Ayad, who is an uh, Assyrian, Arab Assyrian Christian, lives out in Detroit. Uh, with ex his English and understanding of English was exceptional. His pronunciation was great, and I always used him whenever I did interviews. Anyway, Ayad would frequently come to me afterwards and say, Sam, did you really mean to say that? I didn't want to interrupt you, and I said, Ayad, how many times do I have to tell you to, to stop me what I'm saying and tell me that you don't agree with what I'm saying or that it isn't culturally uh, acceptable? Anyway, one of my favorite pictures of, of Ayad grimacing uh, when I was saying something probably pretty dumb. Uh, okay, let's get back to comparing the two uh, because I know we're on a, on a limited time here and I'm talking too much. Uh, pardon me? Oh, Chicago, next slide, please. Uh, we, we faced, a, as I keep telling you, a tremendous uh, difference between what they had and what we had. And, you know, this is... Uh, perfectly understandable and intuitive, so I'll just skip over it unless anybody has questions. We have, we have a very developed system of regulation and, and response. They don't. Uh, this is the training center I mentioned earlier. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Yaikhan Naguib, uh, over here, who was always trying to get me to drive his BMW. He had a BMW 750. Uh, and so he and I worked together. Uh, you can see the, the other picture is just another interesting picture of a group of Iraqi workers. You know, a lot of people say that Arabs don't like to do manual labor. Uh, well, they didn't believe in picking up trash, but they sure did manual labor. And you can see just from the muscul muscles on these guys. Uh, of course, you can see one guy here in the middle with the helmet on. That's Abdul Salam Mullah Muhammad. Uh, one of our linguists, uh, he had to pose. Uh, and this is what the place looked like at the bottom. Uh, resilience. In Iraq, it was truly a single point of failure. There was one layer that didn't talk to each other. I mean, one layer, the parts of which didn't talk with each other. Whereas, as you know, here we just have all kinds of interaction, cooperation, uh, teleconferencing, you name it, and it works together. But the real question is, when you compare Iraq to the United States, how do you transition from routine operations over to the disaster mode and to the response mode? Uh, this is, has been a big issue that is still being uh, debated, fought over, as to is it possible to take a, a, an organization uh, in its existing peacetime state and rapidly turn it into a crisis response, continuity resilient, type of thing. People are, continue to try to train on it, continue to try to be resilient, uh, to, make it, to make it work. And I was reading some things the other day that, you know, where, where it's still an issue in, here in the United States, which is probably one of the better developed there is. Uh, Chicago, next slide, please. Uh, we did a lot of mentoring. Uh, the one with the fellows sitting around is the director general and me. Uh, trying to do some advanced planning, trying to think our way through how we're going to, how we Americans will approach some problems, how they will approach them, and where we came, where we would come together. Uh, another issue is uh, is the the whole resilience issue, and first the the detecting and knowing that uh, epidemic is starting or any kind of whether it's an epidemic of, of uh, disease or an epidemic of environmental or an, an occupational injury, uh, uh, another area of public health, an occupational injury epidemic that all of a sudden you're getting, I don't know, uh, factory injuries from, from whatever the machine is that does something. Uh, but the one issue that I, I mentioned a couple of down here at the bottom, continuity and closure. Uh, one of my life experiences when I was in the White House was working on a uh, continuity of government, continuity of, of uh, programs, uh, and, and the COOP and the COG programs of trying to keep, even in the worst terrorist disaster or worst attack, of trying to keep the government functioning. How do you take all that knowledge and take the knowledge, do knowledge management, and transfer it into the peacetime, into the, 
into the us civilian world. Um, there are just a lot of lessons there. We tried something at the University of Pittsburgh to figure out how in a pandemic or some other public health crisis, how to take the faculty from the Graduate School of Public Health and use the faculty to, to, to staff up the health department, whether it was to take over some of the routine functions or to be out on the front line of setting up the pre, uh, the pre uh, examination. We were trying in Pittsburgh experiments on how to use schools, firehouses, to get people away from the hospitals and do examine them away from so that they're not clogging the emergency room, they're not clogging up the hospital, and, and having a whole system of people going through the, uh, a, uh, an assembly line in a, hot, in a uh, public school uh, with showers and everything uh, there, and how would you use the faculty there? They, they actually now, Sam Stebbins, the fellow we were talking about earlier, uh, Mike tells me is the Arlington County Health Director now, uh, came down from Pittsburgh. Uh, he set up a program now actually using graduate students to, to do this same function. Uh, this is a little, just a, a Chicago next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, these two pictures. One is you can see uh, some of the PRT members stuffing school book bags with not just democracy, get out the vote, because it was, Carlos was really putting together the he bought the book bags to send the, for the kids, with, and he'd put propaganda in there about get out the vote. You know, it's your country, one Iraq, one people. You have to get out, uh, get your parents out to vote. And you can see me there in the red baseball cap uh, stuffing public health literature into everything, the H1N1 uh, thing and some other brochures. Uh, the, the other picture is, is from the earlier one, uh, talking with the media. And uh, I include the lieutenant in this one because he wanted to become a reporter when he got out of the army. So I figured any time I could include him uh, was good. Uh, terrorism, we've all experienced it in our, in our recent lives here in the United States. Uh, it's a little different here than it is over there and of course that leads to very different responses. Uh, I talked about coordination earlier. Uh, Let's try and wrap it up a little bit, and, and I don't know if you've been able to pull any lessons or any ideas out of this, but I'd be interested in hearing anything that you have, any ideas or questions on uh, Chicago. If you would go to the next slide that says lessons. Uh, and the question I finally ask down here is how can we move the lessons of public health and what we learn to the larger set of emergency, whether it's FEMA or the state emergency management agencies or vice versa, and, and how do they tie together? Any questions, That any ideas? Yes, sir. Since 2003, I can only speak to my province and, and what I know anecdotally from what, and, and what people told me. Uh, our province was 98% Shia, one of the two major sects of Islam. Saddam Hussein and his crowd were a bunch of Sunnis. In the south of Iraq, uh, after the invasion, uh, the, uh, after the Kuwait War and, and that, the United States encouraged the Iraqis in the South of Shia to continue to revolt and provided different kinds of support, and they did continue to revolt. Sodom took retribution on them in a number of ways, one by ethnic cleansing, one by killing fields, mass graves, and by denying them infrastructure. You know, you remember there was the uh, oil for food program sponsor, uh, supervised by the United States. The Oil for Food program established uh, uh, Iraq sold oil. The money is supposed to then go to the people for health, nutrition, uh, food, kinds of things. Uh, some small percentage of it went to the people in that. In our area, very almost none. So everything was run down, the hospitals, the clinics, the schools, uh, the central, because everything is centrally managed under Saddam Hussein and still is in a large way. Uh, very little came down to the South in the way of support, infrastructure, training, education, foreign education, 
Uh, most doctors had never been out of Iraq. Most of them had never had any additional education, nor continuing medical education. Uh, the medical education system was, I think, broke, broken. Uh, broken, not financially. It didn't have that either. Uh, so I think, uh, and again, I can only give you an example in my province. Uh, the United States, since 2003, did it was about 6,000 projects worth $305 million. That's a lot of money. Most of that was in the early stages, 2003, 4, 5, before the State Department and USAID really got into the provinces. Uh, it was a lot of military spending. Uh, our team was the only team that sat down and got every database we could find, and we had two people full-time for six months, diverted from their other work, building a database about that thick when you printed it out of all the U.S funded projects, and it didn't matter whether it was State Department, USAID, Military, uh, Project HOPE, or some other NGOs, if it had U.S. money, and we probably didn't capture all of them. Uh, we then started going out and looking for them whenever we would go out, and we couldn't find a large number of the early projects. The rumor, w one was because the grid coordinates weren't, were nowhere near accurate. They're usually a grid coordinate of the contractor, but we couldn't find in a town of about 2,000, in a hamlet of about 2,000 people, we couldn't find the 24-hour wellness, physical fitness, and nutrition center, which had all this fancy gym equipment the military paid for. I'm sorry to say, but I think they were hauling $100 bills, wheelbarrows full out the gate, and dumping them for whoever wanted them. Uh, I think the Iraqis have come a long way, and, and our province, I know, has come a long way, but it's far from anything. Uh, let me just, uh, you remember that uh, under George W. Bush, the idea was a international coalition to overthrow and get rid of Saddam Hussein. Before the United, the United States swept through our province and went on to conquer Baghdad, behind them came the Polish army. And the Polish army had uh, several thousand people at our base. And the Iraqis talk about the Poles as how great they were. Uh, they put in what are called package water plants. They're, they're, they're about this big uh, water plants for a village. Poles put them all over the place. The Poles had a health clinic right outside the gate and every Wednesday, Thursday, it was open for whomever wanted to come. Uh, they didn't worry about people bombing them. If we had done that, we would have worried about people bombing because by the time the United States got back into our province in 2007, there was a lot of rebellion and a lot of terrorism going on and continued uh, until we left and until the military withdrew in December. Uh, that's a long, convoluted answer, but anybody else on? Yes, please, ma'am. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah it's a, that's a good question. Uh, whenever we could, uh, we, we were using, we had a number of female soldiers on the base. Uh, we had one, the time I was there, we only had one female on our team, a State Department person. And when Lynn was pretty senior. She would go out all the time. She was the leader of the team that was searching for U.S. projects. She was doing a, a lot of projects with women, and she and I worked together on women's health projects. Uh, we used female soldiers. Uh, to go out to give classes on uh, female health issues, hygiene and birthing and reproduction issues whenever we could. Though these, these were really touchy subjects. A man couldn't do this kind of thing, so when we, if we had female medics at the, at the military clinic, we could have them do some of this kind of thing. Um, or they would meet with a group of Iraqi female doctors and do that. Uh, we, one of our people spent a lot of money and project time working on uh, vocational training for women. And the object there was to try to give women an independent, train them so they could earn an independent income so they, that they weren't hostage to their husbands and the abuse that took place in many of the homes. We figured that if the women had an independent income, they could take care of themselves and their children without the husband in case they decided to leave. 
We would never encourage such a thing for them to leave. But we did sponsor legal clinics on family law issues and divorce law issues. We sponsored those for women who wanted to come and avail themselves of that. And, and as I understand it, they had has a number of customers on that. Uh, you know, on the cultural issue, uh, women's have, women have a hard time in these places. They, they're viewed as cattle. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how many times, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I don't know how many times I'd be out in the countryside and I'd see a woman herding the sheep, the camels, the whatever, and the husband is sort of sitting there and she's out there moving them along and all that. Other times I'd see women carrying huge bundles of, of wood that they'd, and straw that they'd gather up. Uh, and there would be two or three women carrying these, and a husband sort of, or a man, sauntering along behind them. Uh, on the other hand, the women that were doctors or lawyers, that, and I knew quite a few of them, because I had a program to send uh, people to the United States for a couple of weeks, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months for training and educational programs. And, uh, and through that, I got to know a lot of female lawyers, and I, got, I had already gotten to know a lot of female doctors with whom I had private sessions, no men allowed. And they were willing to talk to me about female issues because I was public health, and they knew that you know, I wasn't going to tell the other Arab men what, what we were talking about. Uh, but so those women, those professional women, when I'd interview them and we'd, I'd eventually work it around, I'd say, and how much respect do you get during a day? Well, the doctors got a lot of respect. The lawyer said, well, they won't let me try cases because I'm a woman. Okay, so I'd get Jeremy, and I drag Jeremy into the meeting. I'd say, Jeremy, I want you to sit down in our room of law guy, sit down and talk with her afterwards and find out what the issues are, and, and then go see you know, how you can get the chief judge to issue a decree that women can argue cases. Uh, the doctors and the lawyers, they would tell me when they went home, uh, they reverted right back into uh, traditional ways of having to live. Many of them wore Western clothes, the, the women. If they were professional women, Western clothes, which some of which, I mean, with, with, a mod with modesty. Uh, but, you know, one even had a drooping neckline that came down to about here. I mean, that's pretty risque where we were. Uh, <laughs> any, anything, any other questions or ideas or lessons that come out of this? Sir? I don't know whether I agree or not because I don't know how they were collected and all that. I've heard the numbers too. I mean, survey techniques and places like that are pretty, pretty tough. And 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 I'll try to remember to go back to Gallup surveys, the Gallup organization, what they were doing. Uh, the numbers are hard to come by. We do know an awful lot of people died, not just during the military action, the soldiers that died during the military action in 2003. We know a lot of civilians died. I've heard 50 to 70,000. Uh, hard, to, hard to know. But the other thing is, uh, because the public health is so bad, uh, in my view, and when I say public health, I, I'll, I'll lump in medical even though I shouldn't, the, the health delivery of health services is so poor uh, that I have no doubt that those numbers could be probably exceeded. I, I just don't know. Yeah. It, I mean, World Health Organization has all kinds of mortality data on their websites, 
and I have a suspicion it understates it. I, I'm sorry. Gallup organization, I suspect one of your competitors occasionally. Uh, we used to have to do a monthly report to the embassy on conditions in our province. Every province did. Not just the price of food, the availability of food, uh, education, the availability, how many kids are getting educated, how much importing, imported goods are coming. Just you name any indi social science indicator, economic or social, we had to do some kind of report on that. Most of what we did was by, we had several Iraqis who were very good at market surveys. Uh, they had had some education in economics and statistics. They did a lot of that. Then we did our own anecdotal estimate, estimates of what we thought the conditions were. A lot of it were political. A lot of the questions were political. Uh, is the government making progress in democratizing? Is the government, is the provincial government, the court system, uh, judging cases properly? Are jail prisoners being treated proper? You know, very hard. So we were doing it pretty much anecdotally, and every month you'd have, have a rating scale, and then you're, some, somebody would make a big chart with arrows, red and green arrows, and all that stuff, and dashboards. And somebody decided that wasn't good enough, and so they hired Gallup to do telephone surveys. And Gallup did phone surveys, and of course, not just our team, but a number of the other teams, when they were going through this, told the embassy, they said, telephone surveys. You're going to get the people that have cell phones, which is 10% of the population. If they're rich enough to have a cell phone, they're probably rich enough to have a generator and electricity, and their kids probably go to one of the private schools, and they probably have a private doctor who isn't even on the government payroll, and they probably go to Lebanon for medical treatment, or Jordan, or India, or even Kuwait. Uh, and, and it was just so counterintuitive. Now, I know this runs against the grain of what you all do for a living, but it, it, to me, doing a telephone survey in an underdeveloped country, now, I know that even we saw a tremendous increase in cell phone usage, cell phone availability, and people with cell phones in the two years I was there. So the problem initially that they tried to solve was that our anecdotal wasn't very good, but the telephone surveys would be better, and maybe they are getting better, I don't know. Uh, we, we got the results, uh, very scattered results. Uh, every month we didn't get the results of the Gallup survey, and if we did, they were, they were classified. Uh, they classified them confidential or secret or something like that. And so, you know, they were good for us to use as background, and we just had to intuit how to then translate that into our, our relations. Uh, did that help a little? Okay, not much. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't answer the question. I don't know. Uh, anybody else questions there? Yes, ma'am. Was there? Yeah. There's a unique, unique part of that, is that they had medical schools, they had nursing schools, they didn't have public health schools, and when I'd say public health, they'd say, oh, you're an MD and you're here to uh, do surgery. This is a problem that my good friend here, and I probably faced all the time, is people think public health is medicine. In, in a way, I would always describe it is public health is taking care of a whole community of people, communities, large communities, to prevent disease, occupational, environmental injury, and, and then thinking through the solutions. Whereas medical, if public health fails, doctors get them one at a time. Uh, the concept of public health uh, was not embedded in the culture, was not something. They had one person in the health department who did environmental, nobody that did occupational, one person that did food inspections. And believe it or not, by the time we left, he was actually issuing orders to close restaurants. Of course, he was probably then under a death threat because the way you solve that problem is you kill the inspector. And that happened. There were 14 assassinations in the month after I left. Uh, I'm told by my, my 
assistant who still lives there and tells me these things. Uh, no. The answer is no. <laughs> Anybody else that I can? Sir. Uh, the chances that it, yeah. Our, my, my theory, our whole theory was if you build something, they have to agree to sustain it for at least five years. I hope that's true. I've told Dr. Yahya that I'm coming back in five years to visit the health training center and to see what it, what it looks like. And he said he'll pick me up at the airport in Baghdad and drive me down and let me drive his BMW. Uh, <laughs> But sustain sustainability <coughs> of, of our work was something we didn't want to do anything that couldn't be replicated or sustained. Uh, the health training center, the minister of health came down to see it because he, he heard about it. The minister himself, just like this Catherine Sebelius, uh, she, he came down, he looked at it, he said, I want one of these in every province. How do we do it? And charged Dr. Yaya to figure out how to put them in every province. Of course, what Yaya was really angling for was to become a deputy minister of health anyway, and up in Baghdad. But uh, I'm just hoping, hoping that, he, that they're able to implement the idea. I originally started off that it would be a medical and public health training center to try to draw the doctors into it. And uh, as it was, I didn't need to do that, so I drew, and it was too complicated a name. Uh, so I just made it public health and focused just on health, public health issues. Even though medical, midwives, I'm sorry, midwives is a medical thing. You know, it was a foot in the door on trying to make them think about public health. Let me, Mike asked me to uh, do a, just a couple other things. Uh, Chicago, next slide, please. Uh, we, we're running out of time, so let's keep going. Chicago, go down to the picture of tribal, the slide of tribal. Next, next. There you go. These are typical tribal scenes. Mike thought you would like a little bit of tourism type pictures. Uh, the picture on the left, the, f the older fellow with the beard and the kid in the, in the uh, green. This was Sheikh Nabil uh, out in Manawiya, which was near Najaf. Uh, this is in his modif, his a room like this uh, solely for ceremonial meetings and for official luncheons. Uh, this was one of his little boys. Uh, that wooden stand you see there was where the uh, imam would go up on, on Fridays to offer prayers, but also where Nabil would go up to render judgments as the tribal leader of over one million people scattered from Basra up to Baghdad, all Shia. Uh, he would ha court cases would come to him rather than into the official judicial system and he would resolve them by sitting up there and making pronouncements. Interestingly, above there are pictures of his grandfather, his, his great-grandfather, his grandfather, his father, and Muhammad, and uh, the prophet. And uh, I asked Nabil one day, I said, tell me, about, tell me about those pictures. And he said, well, my great-grandfather, he worked with the Turkish, with the Ottomans, when they were here. And that's how we got all of our land, by cooperating with them and putting all of our people under their subjection. I said, well, what about your grandfather? Well, he worked with the Turks and then with the British. And he really was good with the British because he got them to build some schools and hospitals and other things. And they let us keep our land and gave us more. I said, and your father? Well, he worked with the British. And he was really good because they gave us even more land. And I said, and how about you? He said, well, now I have you Americans. And you're here to give me things. Uh, the woman in the background there, the female soldier, uh, Corporal Quigg, uh, Alicia uh, uh, had some public health experience, not a whole lot, but uh, she was a reservist and, and she was also a good interface with Nabil because he had his eyes on her a lot. Uh, anyway, the, the other picture is of a typical luncheon with a lot of shakes. Nabil brought in a whole bunch of shakes for a, uh, a wake, an Irish wake, so to speak, for his brother had been assassinated a couple of days earlier by some terrorist. Uh, his brother was a, an important army general. And, uh, and so Nabil 
set up this affair. And I said, Nabil, what can I bring you? What's a good condolence gift? And I said, I want to bring you a lamb, a baby lamb for you to slaughter. But you know, trying to get money to buy a lamb, you know, something you couldn't get through the, the money auditors in Baghdad. I brought him pallets of water, bottled water. That was, and he was so happy, and he knew that was happening, so he brought, he brought all these people in. And to him, it was a great honor for him to be able to host us because these people knew what we were doing for them. Uh, this is a little bit of the religion. This is a very important uh, mosque uh, right next to the main hospital. And you can see the beautiful tile work and calligraphy there, uh, just beautiful tile work. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, I saw some pictures of uh, some tile calligraphy, some tile work and calligraphy in, I think it was Qum in, in Iran the other day. They're just really nice. Uh, the picture of the fella, uh, that's uh, the Imam Ali, uh, and then that's the Sadr family, Muqtada Sadr, who you hear so much about there in the center, and his father and grandfather who were assassinated by Sodom. And then you can see the picture of the women in their uh, black garb. But, but you, the nice thing is you can see the one who is, has, has taken a little bit of a risk and putting something, something non-black on. on. Uh, Mike wondered what the environment was like, and I think this is the last slide. This is sort of a bit of a collage, you can tell, taken from the tower right next to our building. Our building was to the, the lower right. But this was on a very, very dusty day. And uh, uh, you can see, you couldn't see beyond, the, you know, too far away. Anyway, I've run out of time, and you have work to do. I take up an, up an hour and a half, which, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Twenty, that's, uh, twenty, that's thirty man hours of time you've devoted to me. All billable, I hope. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I've talked so long, but... Yeah, you know, but I have so much to tell you. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Yes, Pam, um, I just I, I have one question to the administration. Um, kind of just in line with what you've been talking. Are you hopeful after this experience? What do you see hopeful? If they can get through the violent, they're gonna. They're. It's gonna be violent for a while as it is after any, any occupation or any war. After the end of any war, there's always violence of sorting out who's, who the real winners and losers are. Uh, we left, and we left as we should have left, as they wanted us, obviously, to leave. But we felt we had to leave, that we had done all we could do. Uh, I'm hopeful. I think that we're going to go through a period, another year or two, of real violence. I mean, you don't get the, I get the Iraqi, I get three thick press clippings a day from the embassy in Baghdad, still of Western press, and then morning and evening Iraqi news internal. And uh, it's not a happy picture, believe me, uh, what's going on. So your next question should be, well then, what did the United States accomplish if, if all it is is going to be more killing and more violence? And, uh, and you're right to ask that, and I think well, we got rid of Sodom. We stopped most of the human rights abuses. I think that was important. I mean, they, there were 30-some-odd mass graves in our province, each of which held it, thousands of people, that they were just starting to dig up as we left. They had just actually gotten around to doing that. Uh, I think we've given them hope. We've given them an example. We've uh, showed them that there are different kinds of lives. One thing we did is we showed them that we respect women. And that was, if nothing else, we left that because we did a lot of other programs with, with women voters, with women election leaders, uh, women political leaders. We had somebody come from Columbia University to do a talk on human rights for women. And uh, if that's all we did. And hopefully the Arab Spring will continue to spread and be successful. And uh, whatever that means. There's a great article in this week's New Yorker, I think it came last Saturday, about Mullah Omar in, in Afghanistan. And you want to read that about uh, the hunt for Mullah Omar and what's happening in Afghanistan. And in typical New Yorker fashion, it's very well done. 
deeply researched and well written. And there are a couple of good cartoons scattered around. <laughs> so, okay. Any anybody else? Because I know I know your time is valuable. We didn't get a chance to ask Chicago. I don't know if they can get off of mute and if they have any questions. Chicago, if you're out there and you can unmute, do you have anything to comment or ask? Okay. Well, you know how to contact me through Mike if you need to. Okay, thank you all very much, and thank you for those of you that endured to the end. <laughs>